Well, um, thank you all for coming. It's great to see you. I am going to tell you about Ghost Meeting Lynn, which, we're going to come back to that, was in Second Life. And rather than trying to give you the entire potted history of Lynn Hirschman Leeson tonight, which is actually probably impossible to do, not least because in, even in her last um, major solo show in ZKM in Germany, I think about 30% of the works had never even been seen before. So there's a huge amount of research and work to do with the artist herself in gleaning and gathering the material from her archive. And I met her in her archive. I met her in Second Life. It was the first time I'd ever been to Second Life. I should say we didn't just bump into each other um, because we had avatars. Uh, we'd arranged to meet. I had, had I, I say I had had a avatar built for me because I didn't build it myself. I worked with my colleague Gabby, who's the director of the Abandoned Normal Devices Festival. And she helped me create this very gorgeous, very glamorous um, figure. And Lynn and I made a date. We navigated our avatars in this hyper real, strange, alternative space, and we met up. I was sitting in front of a live audience, a bit like this, in fact, in a conference, and she was sitting in front of a live audience in Utah at the Sundance Festival. And it was quite an important meeting in the sense of bringing together, for me, I'd been writing and thinking about Lynn's work for maybe seven or eight years at that point, and for us to meet in that strange, alternative, third space where we were absolutely present, but we weren't really there, I think was a really important moment in terms of the practice that Lynn's been developing over all these years. So it was very special to meet in that way. I think this is a, an early piece of Lynn's. She's, she did a series of freezing machines, and some of her early work came out of this mask making, working with wax and covering her face with it and creating something that had the essence and the vitality of the lived body, but yet was a strange other object. I think in these early works, although her work goes in many, many different directions after this, I think you can find the nub and some of the kind of key themes and problems and concerns that she's interested in. So there's life. There's how does my face represent who I am at this moment. There's the breath, the idea of animated life, masking, mirroring, touching the skin, self, the idea of being represented through a body as a self, the idea of an other and looking at the self as an other and creating a space that somebody else feasibly could inhabit. Mirroring, looking, a space of hyper-reality, lifelessness, residue. In some ways, these very blunt objects do what she was trying to do later on. They sort of transmit a experience from one person to another that can't really be transmitted. And in that failure, they express something about what it is to be human. So here's another, a couple of pieces that she developed. It's quite interesting that in one of Lynn's first exhibitions where it's called Self-Portrait as Another Person was actually closed down. At a time when art was a particular kind, was seen as a particular kind of object, a particular kind of work, the museum that she presented in couldn't get their head around the kind of problems that she was addressing. And this helped the artist turn to other methodologies of presenting her work. 
But before I talk about those, I want to give a bit of context with a piece of work that's quite recent, but that I think puts in her words some of the context out of which she was coming. So I am the video jockey in this. So I'm going to put on my first clip for you. We're hoping that this, the tr it will automatically read the, the CD and move. So this is called Women Art Revolution. In some galleries, or was taught about in art schools. I've got my secrets kicking up from behind. We keep my secrets, we bury yeah. in time. Your time is gonna come. I think I hear it. In the late 1960s, a few women artists formed a coalition and named it WAR, Women Artists in Revolution. And you have to ask yourself, why it was necessary for them to do this in the first place. The books that you read in those days were written in a way that denigrated women artists if they even mentioned them. As an undergraduate at Harvard University, I don't think there was a single woman artist whose work was ever discussed in any one of my classes. When you're a woman, it's hard to tell that you're being censored when you're not in a museum to begin with. Can you name three women artists? Who's a woman artist? Uh, um, Frida Kahlo. That's one. Yeah. Frida. Just a little bit. Can anyone name? Three women artists. I need two more women artists. Two more women artists. Two women artists. Yes, female. This film is peppered with images that for years you were prevented from seeing because there was no access to them. This film is the remains of an insistent history that refuses to wait any longer to be told. One year after the summer of love, America was still in Vietnam. While at home, the Black Panthers, civil rights, and free speech movements were only part of the subterranean agitations. Another revolution was in progress. There was a moral fervor to gather the fractured, displaced, and scattered remnants of the conditions of obscurity. I was a freshly radicalized graduate student at Berkeley during the free speech movement. I came from Cleveland and was expected to return. But after Berkeley, there was no turning back. I felt an urgency to capture that moment, to hold on to that experience. I wasn't about to trust my own memory. So I felt like it was important to get Lynn to introduce herself to you rather than me to say in a long-winded way the kind of context that she grew out of. <laughs> 
it's quite easy to look back on that time and what we've moved on so far and actually to address identity politics in artwork now is quite complicated for lots of different reasons. Um, Griselda Pollock has written about this, about how potentially artists lose credibility if they address identity issues within their work or even within the wider discourse around their work. But at the time that Lynn was emerging and making work with her peers within the political wider context, it was really important. And it was important to not only make your own work and speak about those issues in your own work, but to develop a wider historical political awareness and discursive environment to discuss those issues. I think there's almost this magical merging of um, histories, creative communities, experiences that come together at the time when Lynn was a developing young artist. For a start, artists were rejecting the institution as the place that validated and the only place that was had credibility as a mode of presentation for artwork, whether it was from the happenings in the late 50s through to the 60s to the kind of political activism that was happening in music culture. And this massively influenced Lynn and her peers. So one of the key pieces of um, practice that I want to touch on is Lynn's work as a kind of finding an alternative place to explore some of these ideas that's maybe a safer zone than doing it with your own identity. So Roberta Brightmore is a figure that Lynn created. Now, you, you, people who've seen the exhibition will already know about Roberta, but she's a very powerful um, creation in her own right. For Lynn, she actually became a bit of a problem, and at the end, she sort of had to draw a close, a very final close on this identity she created. But this was, Roberta came out of a context. So I first started finding out about Roberta when I was working at the Tate on a project about identity theft. And in the late 60s, early 70s, there are a number of artists, female artists in particular, who created alter egos. This is Adrian Piper's mythic being in the middle, who she dressed up as and went out into the streets and documented the experience of being this other male character through which she could act and do different things and behave in different ways and explore what it was to operate in a different manner. There are a number of artists who explored these things. Eleanor Antins, the king, from 1974, and she dressed up as this um, king, would go out into the streets. More in, in a different way to um, Piper, whose figure potentially blurred into the background, the king was more flamboyant, more carnivalesque, more exaggerated in his performance. And then, of course, operating in a different way because they weren't necessarily in um, as a public performance, was Cindy Sherman's explorations of identity through taking on other people's identities and documenting that experience. So that gives a context for Roberta. Roberta first existed through putting an advert in the newspaper searching for a housemate. She went to art galleries, she dated men, she had a bank account, she had, she wrote in her diary, she had her own bespoke handwriting. She had a code of conduct which the artist very carefully and calculatedly described and tried to um, give as a, as a model. So in particular, she was constructed through makeup, a mass used tool, something that was very familiar, um, something that could be quite easily coded. Of the artist of Roberta, the artist said 
Roberta was an interactive tool with which it was possible to analyze culture. Her profile was brought to life through cosmetics, applied to her face as if onto a canvas, and her experiences reflected the values of the society that she lived in. Essentially, she was programmed. But what's important, I think, for Lynn is she describes two phases in her life as BC and AD, before computers and after digital. And um, Roberta is clearly part of the BC generation. So what you can see is certain behaviors, certain ways of working that then migrate into a different era when different tools and different practices become available. So interactivity and the things that um, Lynn works with later, are, you can see their heritage and their lineage in these early performance works. Um, Lynn was quite clear to identify certain elements of the archive of Roberta as being external identity factors and other elements as being internal identity factors. One of the things that Roberta did was go to a psychiatrist and experience some form of psychotherapy. I think moments of Roberta seem very clear cut and um, understandable. Other moments seem borderline scary. Um, the psychiatric reports, which you can see some of them upstairs, show that the, um, on a professional level, this character was deemed to have some fairly significant problems. So this is one of her letters that she wrote to um, somebody she was going on a date with. Here's her driving license. This is a letter from her psychiatrist. Here's her diary. These objects become documents, and obviously they're documents, but what I mean is they are historical documents. They provide a viewer with a range of touch points with which to pin together, piece together, the historical life, the context, the environment, and the internal workings of this character. I think that's one, something that's really useful of thinking about when we think about Lynn's work. She says, it is essential that artists invent forums for their work, even if it may, means reframing the context. I believe that historical relevance is part of the process of completing a work. And so I think, for me, one of the things that's very interesting about the way Lynn works is she doesn't just make works, she creates a context into which to put those works, and she works and operates as a historian to archive and develop that context retrospectively. Um, in her very early operations as an artist, she created a set of pseudonyms who um, were art critics who wrote about her work. And I think, again, these strategies of moving away from the self and creating this third person alter ego who can reflect back on the self is, is really fascinating as a method of creating a dis discussion and dialogue about your work. Here's a bank account. And here she is as she climbs the steps of Del Corondo Hotel to meet a, de a date. Again, on another date. Obviously, there's some ethical issues that we might, might want to discuss. I believe that she only ever went on a date with each man once, so that it wasn't, she was never sort of setting up a promise or um, something that she couldn't follow through. And then Roberta expanded. And here's where the coding and the programming comes in place. So she invited other people to take on the role of Roberta and to operate as Roberta in the real world. She outlined carefully Roberta's body language and almost in a sort of fetishistic manner, created a set of coded clothing that Roberta would wear. This idea of 
working and operating not inside an institution but in the midst of the world was central to Lynn, but also came out of a, of a historical moment where artists were rejecting institutions as the be-all and end-all for cultural value. One of Lynn's most famous works is um, a project she did very early on in the Dante Hotel. So audiences were invited to come and explore this environment and piece together the narratives and stories that they might imagine. And that idea of shifting the space of the audience from being a very passive, very um, receiver type space of working into a much more active, subjective, complex, incomplete, um, dependent on the mood or the time or the moment is really important, I think, for certainly Lynn's later works as she moves into a more digital environment. And I think in terms of the politics of the artist, trying to shift that from being active into uh, passive into being active was central because so much of her work is critiquing the way that mainstream media sort of immobilizes an audience and renders them politically mute, unable to comment back. The media that is transmitted to them is um, essentially, as she would describe it, a one-way mirror. So moving to her digital era, um, a really important piece of work here was Lorna. And very similar to Roberta, Lorna is again a figure, and you can see um, some of the Lorna work upstairs. She was the first ever interactive art video disc, which now sounds incredibly archaic. Um, but at the time, again, it was this, the possibilities of technology to shift and shape and change the way that audiences and users might interact with material was extraordinarily radical. Um, what a video disc did was allow a narrative to exist as an archive, which could then be pieced together by a user, rather than somebody sitting mute and a receptor of a simple narrative that came on a, in a linear basis through a film. So Lorna was unlike Roberta, who was dynamic and sexy and out there. Lorna was agoraphobic, lonely, stuck, didn't want to leave her room. Her room had become um, quite overwhelmingly symbolic. Each item in her room that you could scroll through um, had its own piece of narrative that you could add to. And a very different kind of female experience that Lynn imagined as a lived experience. Here's the program schematic for Lorna. And what Lynn says of Lorna is that Lorna is literally captured by a mediated landscape. Her passivity, presumably caused by being controlled by media, is a counterpoint to the direct action of the player themselves. So for Lynn, she was very interested in the way that Lorna reflected back on the user and reflect, made the user reflect on their own lives. I'm going to move to show you, mm, not that one, another clip. And this is Seduction of a Cyborg. Understanding science fiction as a really important source for Lynn Hirschman Leeson is incredibly important. But it's only one element of the way that she approached thinking about the way that new technology would change and shape human consciousness. I think one of the things that's really important to Lynn is the way that 
uh, new technologies have unexpected outcomes. And from those outcomes, we need to consider quite carefully as a human constituency what they might mean to how we might operate in the future. In the beginning, it seemed innocent enough, a simple hope to compensate for her loss of sight. Though her hearing was acute, she was born with eyes that lacked the ability to absorb light. The choice seemed simple. In exchange, the rewards of recognition guided her forward. Seductively linked to computer transmissions, images of simulated worlds, sounds, masked passions gave enormous pleasure. The addiction came quickly. but each dose altered and decoded biological ecology. Her immune system suffered. Still, she couldn't stop. And soon there was no choice. Even her hearing became impaired. The manipulation was thorough and unprejudiced. She witnessed the pollution of history. <laughs> Her body, a battlefield of degraded privacy, loneliness, and terror, succumbed to the inevitable. <laughs> 
So it's easy to forget that that film is over 20 years old. Oops. And some of the, the content is not dissimilar to the kind of things that people are speaking about in mainstream media now, about how we sit and um, lose the, our sense of reality by placing our desires, our needs, our time, our bodies at the service of our connection to our technology. I really see a um, thinker from many of the artists going to the as much as Lewis. And I've heard Lynn synthesize this in her own words. But going back to it, it's man becomes a little world, a sex organ of the machine world. As the bee of the plant world, enabling it to fungitate and to evolve of ever new forms. The machine world reciprocates man's love by expediting his wishes and desires. So this idea was really central to a lot of the work that Lynn did. Deep Contact 1984, uh, again, it's another invention using the, a video disc, but thinks about touch, thinks about how content that is behind the screen can implicitly touch and connect with real life outside of the screen. So literally this piece starts with the actress trying to reach through the screen, tapping on the screen and inviting the viewer to touch me. Agent Ruby, which you can see the content of later on, uh, upstairs, it, there's a whole room dedicated to Agent Ruby learns and listens and in an artificial intelligence environment brings the material from the real world into a computer system which then reformats it and en ensures that the program itself learns from its viewer. I remember seeing this piece, I think it was two, either 2005 or 2006 in Zero One San Jose and being quite astonished at how you could stand in an art gallery and have a conversation with the intelligent iBot inside the work and it would speak back to you in a fairly um, believable manner. I'm going to move through these ones quite quickly and return to this point because um, actually we've only got a few more minutes of talking before we can speak to each other. Um, throughout her work, Lynn has tried to create archives and tried to create environments where not just her voice, but the voice of her peers, the voice of the people who are thinking alongside her can be shown. Um, at the beginning, we started with Women Art Revolution. That was a documentary which came out of I don't know, there was something like 12,000 uh, hours of footage which Lynn had shot over the course of her life with the women and other and male artists who she'd worked with just telling the story of their lives. Essentially, at her heart, Lynn is a documentary maker and as well as the science fiction element to her work, she's interested in this idea of science true. And I've got stacks of um, DVDs at home, including interviews that she did with early artificial intelligence developers, um, virtual life developers, all the way through as technology has advanced, Lynn has seen it as her mission as an artist to explore and investigate and understand what that te technology might mean. I want to show a, the trailer for a, what I think is one of a, a really important piece of work that she developed. And it's probably worth saying that working across many different formats, she's made major feature films as well as more experimental shorts. This one was an a important feature film that she made. <laughs> 
I think it was 2000. An artist and college professor may have been mistaken for a possible bioterrorist. It's my wife. She's not breathing. Steve Kurt called 911 early on the morning of May 11th after his wife suffered cardiac arrest and died in her sleep. Police arrived on the scene. They saw petri dishes and sophisticated scientific equipment. Through his grief, Steve Kurtz explained it was all part of an art exhibit about genetically altered food. We make art that questions the relationship between art, commerce, and biotechnology. Unconvinced, the police called the Joint Terrorism Task Force. Soon it was not only police searching his home, but also FBI men in hazmat suits. They said that I had terrorist Arabic writings in my house. Is that Arabic writing? It was an invitation to an art show. They want to charge me with possessing weapons of mass destruction. They are trying to manufacture a crime, and they are trying to construct me completely as something that I wasn't. I worked for the FBI in the Buffalo office. Like they had been reading our emails or listening to our phone calls, they were watching the house. The FBI seemed to have been interested in Steve's politics. That they were against the activities of the art ensemble. This was a way to get him. We've drawn up this petition. We signed this petition. The FBI is going to have our names on file, right? People have to know what's happening in this country. It's too important to keep quiet. The majority of Americans don't know what's in their food. The corporations are patenting life forms. There's really big money attached to all of it. The fact that the government is watching an art group whose subject happens to be illuminating the population about transgenic foods is the real point here. I think it's the first time this has ever happened uh, in the history of federal court, where somebody is being charged for fraud, but no party feels defrauded. This is not about finding out the truth. This will be a huge expansion of power for the Department of Justice. If an artist is silenced, then the potential is for everyone to be silenced. Pope would never forgive us. He always said, you know, never surrender, never give up. So that was a, a film called Strange Culture, and it tells the story of an artist called um, Steve Kurtz, who made incredible work December 21, 2012, the end date of the sophisticated long count calendar created by the ancient Maya in Central America. Countless books and contexts on the things that surround us, um, resulting in us operating environments that we are completely unfamiliar with, but yet we don't understand, and we're not able to have any political agency within. The um, Infinity engine that you can see upstairs where she's explored um, different scientific processes and some of the genetic engineering and its, its motivations as well as its um, output is an example of that. But as a documentary maker, some of what she does is also try and make um, these specialist environments familiar to us. So literally taking a camera into um, a biomedical genetic engineering laboratory, which most of us would never see, and interviewing people who work with this material. So the personal interview has been the backbone of her research and her work. And the two things, the research and the work, often merge so that there's a continuum between um, what she's looking at as an interested, engaged artist, citizen, and what she's interested in as a creative individual. I think 
the final things I want to say about Lynn, in terms of why am I interested in Lynn's work. I think she provides a model for how to be an artist, which is really important. In her war film, one of the few men that was filmed is an artist called Mike Kelly, and he was also often referred to as the model of an artist. What does an, what does an, how can an artist operate in the world that other artists can learn from? So for Lynn, embracing your peers Often we look up to those who have gone before us, but most of our creative energy will come from direct connection with those who are around us now. Exploring the world and being a, even when you're not necessarily um, educated in a specific environment, being a critical observer of the world and educating yourself through creating new connections with people who know about things that you don't know about. And then performing into that world. So not just making work that sits on the wall, but making work that engages, connects, agitates, and um, leaves a trace in the world. I think those are the things that make, for me, Lynn a really interesting and important artist. And I'm going to leave it there because we're now 10 to 8 and I think we have time for some conversation. Thank you. I can't see you very well. It's very dark. Has everybody in the room seen the show? No. Very briefly. So a couple of the pieces that I showed you, um, the seduction of a cyborg ball from 94, are in the show. Um, and Women Art Revolution is in the show as well. So four, four feature films are in the show. And then there's a really fantastic archive of um, Roberta Brightmore, this character she created. Um, and then some of the early interactive pieces. The problem of presenting early interactive pieces is obviously that the technology... I mean, the technology in our pockets now is so extraordinary compared to that kind of technology. It's a challenge to see its political potential outside of our sort of technological collective awareness. I think it's probably worth pointing out that some, the most effective technology is that which makes itself invisible to us so that we stop questioning its alternative um, uh, potentials, but we just start absorbing it into our daily lives. But does anyone have any thoughts or questions? Hello. I'm sure some of that was in there. I mean, Roberta went to Weight Watchers and things like that. There was, and you know, those. I, I think it's quite interesting when you start really watching lots of Lynn's um, short films and the, the work that she's made. She made um, a really important ongoing piece, Electronic um, Video Diaries, where she just talked to camera, sort of preempting this sort of disclosure environment that we operate in now. And she's be well before then. Um, she hasn't shied away from what might be the more embarrassing stereotypes. And sometimes she has allowed those to exist quite strongly, perhaps so that we can see them as, as that. Um, yeah. Please do. Oh, 
think I think there's a lot of interesting connections that you would find in Lynn's work, but also a really good starting point is to watch the Women Art Revolution film, where it's it's so easy for somebody of my generation to go I push that out of my field of vision. But if those women hadn't done that 30 years ago or however long it was, then many of the women who are able to operate in quite powerful positions within this country and other countries, both within institutions and as artists, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be doing it. And so I think as a starting point for thinking about what those things mean, the women art revolution stories, some of which are heart-wrenching and some of which are you, you make you feel quite awkward and they're, when people are angry, sometimes they take a step too far, sometimes they take, you know, they're not organized, neat um, pieces of work. They're furious, they're engaged, they're um, at the height of their emotions. And I think that's a really interesting place to start. And it is also partly why we feel quite uncomfortable with it in uncomfortable with it in other parts of um, culture and especially in terms of um, women artists now making work in that has potentially a market for it why I think many of them will distance themselves from that kind of work because it has that frenetic energy which is associated with this political activism which is now we are still when we're now uncomfortable with because we want to enjoy the rewards of that activism without understanding where those rewards necessarily came from. Mm -hmm. It almost feels, because I've looked at lots of different female artists, that in a way, because as women, we construct ourselves and we paint our faces, that we can use ourselves as na perhaps more naturally as canvases. And it almost feels as though it would be amazing to have an exhibition at some point which which touches on that because you do have people like Cindy John and you do have, I can't remember her name, but I think she's a French female artist that literally had plastic surgery. Uh, or Yeah. 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 So I was talking about the ICA to reinvent ourselves. And there are all these incredible droplets and catalysts which are specifically powerful to technology in the way that we now construct our images our perceived, whether it's in selfies or Facebook or however on the airbrush. It just seems sort of pivotal in looking back and forward in those in those key moments. And it would be just wonderful to have that kind of exhibition which mm. almost because there's there is the history there, and, we, and I think now we're so caught up in technology and where we are now that we sometimes do forget to look back. And some, I'd never heard of her, mm -hmm. even though I have heard of Cindy Sherman and other female artists. But mm -hmm. I think well, there have been exhibitions, and there's there's a really important one called Double Life, which was yeah. curated by um, a very important um, living curator called Ruth Nowak, and that's a really fantastic book that I could recommend to you. But yes, I think there's, there's more space to explore this stuff, and I think that's why it's important. It's important that um, Lynn Hirschman Leeson has had the major um, solo show at ZKM in Germany, in Karlsruhe in Germany, which is huge. Yeah. Um, and that's, but that's a specialist technology center. And so it's got another kind of importance that the exhibitions happened here in Modern Art Oxford, which is an institution that is so um, deeply associated with contemporary visual art. And so in that sense, something that's come from a, very, a more niche position has moved into a, I, I don't really want to put the sentence together that modern art Oxford is mainstream because it's done very expen experimental things over the years. But nevertheless, it's operating in, a, in a, um, a, a broader field. So this is, I think, I think this is Lynn's first, mate, well, certainly her first major solo show in the UK for a, significant amount of time. So this show itself is a really important gesture towards that. So hopefully there will be other kinds of research and exhibitions that develop from it and people will you know who hadn't heard of this figure will hear of her and 
make put two and two together with other kinds of mm. practices. But actually, there's um, it, I was recently in New York at the new museum, um, the Triennial, and it's called Surround Audience. And there are a huge number of young artists addressing these kinds of weird spaces between identity slippage, the use of technology in their daily lives, the um, creation of different kinds of identities through whether it's text or media or um, whether, you know the kinds of um, strange identities that the internet provides space to be created that then merge back into the original identity. So these things are actually very current because lots of what Lynn was thinking about was preempting the kinds of issues that we might we might start to struggle with as this technology became more integrated into daily life and reached um, its sort of zenith. And we are. So that's partly why it's so relevant to look back at it. And um, those problems are there. Is there anything else? Any other thoughts or questions? I'm aware that we're oh, yes. There's two. There's two there, but I'll, so I'll take this both. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I think you can see there's there's a piece there's a piece of footage I was going to show you, but then I realised I would wouldn't have enough time to get through the material I wanted, which is actually in the exhibition, which is partly why I didn't show it. Which is there's only one small fragment of footage of Lynn turning herself into Roberta, and it's just her in front of a mirror becoming Roberta. Um, the some of the therapy, if you read carefully some of the documents. Clearly, what the therapist is talking about is the problem of these dual personas. <laughs> that in turn, is this a is this a mental health issue? What, you know, what does this mean? How does this um, you know, what what is this a manifestation of? Let's say. Um, now there is another film that's probably useful in her archive. I don't know whether I don't think this is in the exhibition, but um, early on there was a like an interview document, a uh, sort of documentary with Lynn asking her about, and, and Lynn in this film takes on the role as a sort of curator talking about herself in the third person. And that's quite an interesting example of her trying to muddle up and um, deal with Lynn, the artist, Lynn, at, you know, part of what she studied was cultural management and she'd worked as a production assistant or produ uh, associate producer for a very famous artist, Christo, whose work was to wrap um, mm -hmm. landscapes and buildings. And so at the early point of her career, as she was knitting together the work she did to make money, the, her performance works, um, that sort of mediated position is quite, you can see that in some of those very early archive pieces. There's also um, a couple of work she did adverts on the TV, um, talking about herself in the third person, but it is Lynn Hirschman talking about herself as opposed to um, one of her characters. But no, I don't think the full spectrum of what you're suggesting exists, but I think you can pick through it in terms of different fragments of the archive that exist. And you had a question as well, yeah, um, or a thought. I could fabricate you an answer, but I don't know the answer. <laughs> um, that's really a kind of question that we should ask Lynn. I don't know. This, this um, event, this talk has been streamed live, so maybe Lynn's watching. That's something somebody wants to know about your work. Um, can you find some way through the mediated world to let us know? 
Okay, so on that note, I think I'm going to close. But thank you all for coming, and um, I really hope you enjoy the show, and I hope that us talking about it will you know, spin off some new ideas for you. So thank you. Thank you.